Hello, everyone. It's me, Andrew. I'm here at Star Cottage Studio. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit late today. Uh, if you are in southwestern Pennsylvania, particularly around the Ligonier area, you might be aware of the current weather, um, which is less than delightful in my esteem. Some people may like this. Uh, but I uh, always I always underestimate how much longer things take when the weather's like this. It's completely pitch black right now, by the way. Um, and we had a bunch of snow and ice today. So it's not my favorite to drive in. And I must, uh, when we were cleaning out the car over the warm period of time, uh, taking um, the window scraper, uh, the ice scraper, and put it somewhere because I can't find it. Um, so I was out there with the broom trying to knock the uh, crust of ice off the windshield. So that took a little bit longer. And then driving here took a little bit longer. Um, and then also there was this car driving really, really close behind me. I thought they were going to jump up in the back seat at that. Uh, I was like, who drives that close when there's snow and ice on the ground? They must have a lot of faith in their brakes. Um, anyways, I'm here now. And so, yeah, we've been super busy getting ready for New York, getting the house ready for the house sitter. And um, <sighs> there's just a lot of details. So we originally, we were going to take the train. And then we looked at the train prices and we were like, oh, that's not too bad. We're going to have to leave a little bit earlier in the day than we had wanted to on the last day so that we could catch our train. Um, and then we were like, oh, okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll get that when we get some more money in the account. And, um, we waited too long. The prices doubled. Um, so then I looked at Megabus and it seemed on par with what we would have paid if we took the train and there's a little bit more flexibility in the schedule because there's more buses that leave. The only issue was that it was leaving from State College, which is, if you're not familiar, um, is in the very center of the state. It's in the very middle and um, it's uh, about two hours away from us, give or take. So not exactly the most convenient it's not like terrible, but uh, the hiccup, the, the big hiccup with that is that we would have had to have found parking in State College um, because the place that they let people park, uh, which is a Walmart, you can't do like extended uh, parking. So uh, all today, me and William were going back and forth about how, you know, finding the best solution. I mean, he was actually doing work at his other job. It was mostly me being like, oh, what if we do this? What if we do this? What if we do this? And he was like, I'm at work, trying to work, but I'll try to talk to you on my lunch break. Um, but anyway, so, uh, yeah, so back and forth, back and forth. Uh, we finally decided after we would have paid for the bus tickets and uh, the parking in State College and uh, the Uber back and forth to the car that we, and also trying to take an Uber at like three o'clock in the morning on the one night uh, that we're just gonna drive. We got our car, uh, I don't know exactly what was wrong with it, but it sounded terrible. And I thought something was coming loose. Um, and so there was some issue with one of our, our cars. And so we got that fixed. I think it was a wheel bearing. Was that a real thing? If Willen's watching, he'll know. But anyways, so we got that fixed up. Um, so... 
we can take the little car, which is a little bit easier. The times that William and I have both driven in the city have been times that um, we've mostly driven like U-Hauls and large vehicles. So um, it'll, I think it'll be okay. It'll be easier because our one car, um, which has uh, the four wheel drive is kind of like driving a go-kart. So um, I think that it could actually be fun. So we have a little bit more flexibility and when we can leave, that means we have a little bit more flexibility in theory, you know, w with uh, the weather. Also, I feel a little bit more, I don't want to say confident, but uh, having our own vehicle allows us to like, you know, have our own vehicle and that has its own issues. But like I've seen where people have gotten stranded um, by the side of the road um, when a bus breaks down and that seemed just like very, I don't know, out of your control. Anyways, hopefully you all are having a great start to your weekend. I'm going to see who's watching. Teresa's watching. Hey, Teresa. Marianne's watching. Howdy, Marianne. Cynthia says, I despise snow with a passion. You know, if I don't have to do anything in it, I'm not too bad. Uh, the I'm driving the minivan today, and it almost got stuck it in the driveway at Star Cottage Studio. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, dumb, 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 dumb. Because I totally spaced on the fact that we needed to put an extra layer of gravel um, in our parking lot. Last year, I was like, oh, we need to get that. When it was cold time, I was like, we need to get that gravel. We need to get that gravel. We need to get the gravel. And then when it, the warm time came, something happened. I must have got the amnesia from the, from the sun or something. But I forgot. We, we forgot about getting that gravel down. And so it's a little, it's a tad slippy, as they say here around here, um, in front of the cottage, and I almost got stuck. So um, that was also not the most pleasant way to start the the live today. But luckily, we didn't get, I didn't get stuck, and um, yeah. So y'all. I'm not, I'm not built for this. Hawaii. Calgon, take me away to Hawaii. Actually, let me finish New York Jewelry Week and then we'll go to Hawaii. I don't know. I would love to. Jamie, are you watching? I can't wink very well, so. Or Christy. Christy, you live there now. Um, all right. Suzanne is watching. Howdy, Suzanne. Marianne says, accident numbers at first real snow, um, imply relying on brakes is a mistake. Uh, correct. I know. I drive, I, I think I'm a relatively safe driver. Um, there are times when I admit that I don't always follow the rules of the road exactly. Um, like, you know, you're supposed to not go outside of the lines kind of thing. But if I see something in the in the lines and I'm going to hit it, I will go around it. And I think that's okay. You know, I'm not going to drive into, he into, you know, oncoming traffic or anything. But so I'm pretty careful. Um, also, my driving vision is not what it used to be. So I am like the little old grandpa that drives, the little Asian grandpa that drives. Um, and uh, that's my reality now. So I am pretty careful um, when it comes to that. Knock on wood. I try to be at least because I guess I, I just don't want to have problems. You know, I'd rather spend money on beads or books or jewelry or things that I like instead of having to repair the car. So that's me. 
you know. Um, Donna's watching. Howdy, Donna. Um, Marion says, wheel bearings are real. Um, in theory, William told me about what happened. Um, but sometimes if it's something that doesn't require my active participation in that decision, it, it, it doesn't always stick. So, um, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I know he does, it doesn't always stick when I talk to him. So, um, we're equally matched in our Teflon ability not to retain certain information. Um, Norma's watching. Hey, Norma. Donna says, yeah, I'm not a fan of snow. Um, it's not too bad. It, it's always, I think, I don't know. It's always just more startling when it first happens. Because, like, by January or February, we're, like, driving on the tundra. And there's, like, you know, when I first moved to Pennsylvania, I, re I really hadn't driven a whole lot. Um, I grew up in Florida, and we didn't have very much money. So I took mostly, like, the bus and stuff. or bummed a ride off friends. Um, and then I moved to New York. And um, in New York, you know, you have to take the subway, take the bus, um, take the ferry. You know, there's so many things like public transportation was just like, you just did it. Um, so when I moved to Pennsylvania, I really hadn't had that, that much experience driving. Um, I had taken a year off of school um, to help with Azalea when she was born. Um, and I learned how to drive then, um, and then it was like marathon driving all over the country. Um, but yeah, so I, I didn't realize like there are tricks when you're driving in the snow. Um, and so I had to get used to that because we lived out in the country when we first moved here, more country than we are now. Um, we lived about 20 minutes away, and we lived pretty far out. Um, and so there are things like you, the road would get compacted with ice, and they're like, oh, just drive on top of that. And it's like, this ice skating? What are we doing? Um, but you just get used to it. Like, there's things like you just tap the brake gently instead of, like, slamming down and, um, you know, don't go too fast. Don't try to stop too fast. Um, things like that. Make sure your car has enough weight in it. Different things like that. Um, and it's not actually that bad out. The roads are actually pretty fine. Um, but it was super dark and it was raining. And I felt it was like that freezing rain. And I felt like the rain was like, you know, in Star Wars, where they're like shooting off into outer space in that galaxy far, far away. If that's how it felt when I was driving. So that was not my favorite. And the fact that the one, the car behind me, I was like, they're, they, are they like thirsty? Do they want to sip on my drink? Like what's happening? Why are they so close? So close. Um, but anyways, people are like, where's the beads? Why are we talking about driving in the snow? What the heck, y'all? Um, Susan's watching. Hey, Susan. Susan says, oh, no. Snow is a four-letter word. It is. Particularly for me. I'm getting better, but, um, you know. Marion says, who follows all the rules? Hopefully not everybody because that's how, you know, I don't know. Maybe I have that life preservation thing. Like I see something and I'm like, oh no, go around. Or, oh no, speed up so you don't get into the sandwich of death. Um, I don't know. Um, Susie says, hello. Hey, Susie. Um, Susan says, yes, better to spend money on uh, she said, yes, better to spend money on car repairs. 
I feel as though it's better to spend money on books than car repair. But, you know, as long as things are maintained, you know, I don't want to have, like, be driving around in the danger mobile. Norma says, I love snow. I think snow can be pretty, um, especially when we lived out in the country. It was beautiful. Like, it was like living in a painting, um, like a Bob Ross painting, where he's like, happy little tree with the happy little snow. Um, but I grew up in Florida, and, you know, I'm pretty well acclimated to southwestern Pennsylvania at this point, but... Uh, I don't know. I don't want, there are things like, I don't like my feet to be cold and wet. And I feel like that's like winter is like cold, wet feet season. And I just feel, I don't know. Also, it just, everything takes much, so much longer, at, at least for me. Like when I'm getting ready, I'm like, oh, did I wear my thermal underwear? Did I put this? Do I have this scarf? Do I have that hat? I'm always losing stuff, too. I feel like when those kids where they should have, like, you know, this, like, tied to them or they have, like, their names, like, stitched in. And um, Cynthia made me this really beautiful hat that's super soft. And I'm, like, super paranoid about losing it. So, um, and there's a couple people who've made me, like, handmade scarves. And I am always fearful that I'm going to leave them somewhere. Um, and apparently it would be like a little trail. Follow the, the trail and you'll find the children. Um, how is it for everybody? Are they able to comment okay today with the um, StreamYard? I know William was having, um, having some issues yesterday. Um, if you didn't see yesterday's live, we showed lots of um, Molly wedding beads. I love them. I think they're great. I want to make a huge, once I win that lotto, there will be signs. There's going to, I'm going to have to make a necklace and it's going to, it's going to resemble like a cat made of beads of Molly wedding beads surrounding my, my throat. And people will see me coming and they'll say, Oh, there he comes. Um, Anyways, so uh, we had showed those and we also debuted or teased some new kits that we got, some winter themed kits. I've been working my fingers to the bones. You may be able to see it. There are signs. The, um, and if you, you're like, oh, you don't have bags in your eyes. Uh, the, that's because I have this special cream that I put on. And it feels like it sucks the energon up into them. Um, but it only works so well. And I get nervous using that because I'm like, how, you know, like how far is it going to pull? Um, anyways. Susan says, meant not to spend money on car repairs. Correct. That's what I thought. I was like, I know you. You like books too. Donna says, well, when you live where I do, people don't know how to drive in it. Plus everything, and I mean, everything shuts down. Um, well, there are simple things like having the right tires. That helps. People salting the roads. That helps. Um, people being able to clear the roads. That helps. Not hitting black ice, you know, or, or, be, or knowing not to, like, try to, like, I don't know, like hydroplane kind of style. Um, so there's, you know, there's tricks. Um, we did one year when we drove to Tucson, we got hit with a terrible snowstorm. And, uh, at first we took, there's like a Northern route to Tucson that we take. That's our, just like, basically if you cut the country in half, um, you just drive along that and it goes through the mid, kind of the middle section. Um, and usually we take that if the weather's okay, because it's a straight shot. Um, but we had to go on the southern route and then kind of make our way back down to go kind of along the border. Um, and we still hit some super terrible weather. And it wasn't that bad. Like, um, it wasn't that bad, except that 
nothing was, nobody was prepared for it. So we were in Texas and Greg was driving and this car spun off the road. Um, and luckily uh, we were able to get the car out of the ditch um, and we didn't like roll or anything, but that was a little bit heart stopping um, in that, you know, and that was in, I believe, Lubbock, Texas. Um, so that was not my favorite drive out. Um, so, but you know, it's like here, that little dusting of snow would have been, wouldn't have been anything, but since they don't really have like plows or salt, salt trucks and things that made it super dangerous. Um, Susan says, I wish our country invested more in public transport. You know, I do too. There are other places, um, and you can go like the bullet trains and stuff and they're like super affordable for one um and they're super fast and you just get on there and you're just there um so it's a little bit you know i wish they did too um when i was a child they were voting on stuff in florida for a light rail and they put millions, if not billions, of dollars into it. And I don't know if it, if that ever turned into anything. Um, because I I don't take the train down to the, go down there. So, anyways, uh, it would be nice to have that. You know. But I think that there, there are bigger forces than you or I. You or me. Me making those decisions and so you know anyways susan says ew i hate driving on ice it's not my favorite but i'm getting kind of used to it the minivan does not have all-wheel drive it has a light that glows that tells you you that you're in danger um it's a little car and there are little swiggly lines underneath and that's that it says you're in danger. It's your car's slipping and sliding. It's like I I'm aware of this. Um, we should have maybe gotten one with an all-wheel drive, but I think they didn't have that for one thing, and it would have probably made the car a lot more expensive than what we got it for. Um, Norma says I hate ice as much as I love snow. Debbie's watching. Hey Debbie. Um, Marion says, driving on straight ice is not my favorite. Um, Susie says, I hadn't driven in snow until I was in my 30s and had moved to Virginia from Florida. I bet that was eye-opening. Um, Eden says, ice coming down in Lehigh Valley, PA. I don't know where that is. I think, or is Lehigh Valley on the east? towards the east side of the state um because we had it coming down here so i'm assuming that it moved that way um i think it's maybe done knock on wood hopefully fingers crossed um because if i get stuck here it's going to be very interesting there's no bathroom yet so um if i get stuck here it's going to be i'm going to be uh hitching a ride out on the on the highway hopefully they see me Susan says, some rules are made to be broken. Especially when it's, like, for the greater good, you know. Um, Lorraine says, hi, Andrew and everyone. Hi, Lorraine. Marion says, my cat ma car maintenance was um, 1800 Oh, that sucks. I hate that. Norma says, yes, I grew up in Pittsburgh, so lots of snow, more than there is nowadays, actually. Um, I believe it. When we first moved here, they said, oh, the, 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 the winters are so mild now. You'll, you'll be lucky if you get um, a dusting of snow over winter. And, of course, that winter, there was a snowstorm, and... Um, 
it was like stacked up to the the building i said y'all lied to me i don't know why you lied to me but this i'm getting the cabin fever i don't know it's all i don't know what's happening um so that was a bit nerve-wracking but yeah lately the the winters are not as bad um sometimes the ice can be pretty bad um and i think now that we live in town it's a little bit it's a little bit easier in some ways like when we lived out in the apartment um if it got cold if it got too cold the water in the lines could freeze and there was one year when the power went out for just a little bit and the in that time the water and the lines froze and we didn't want the pipes to bust so we had to like heat them and stuff and that was not my favorite but you know you have to do what you have to do suzanne says ordered my new kit thank you suzanne shakita is watching hello how are you um norma says i love the new kits i ordered too and hope i can find money for more oh great thank you so much we so appreciate all of your support um Normally we appreciate it, but even more when we are working on big plans. Um, I don't really know how people monetize going to New York Jewelry Week. So this is my, our first time going and we kind of wanted to scope it out. Um, so I'm not sure how people monetize this. Like I know people are going to it and they and some of the people going i know don't have like tons of money so i was like how are they going and so i don't know if they're lining up teaching or speaking engagements or um piggybacking off of some other thing or they are just making a ton of money through the shows that that are popping up throughout the city um i don't know and we haven't decoded that i'm gonna pick people's brains like crazy over the weekend, be like, how'd you, how'd you get here? What's the secret? Um, because we're kind of, we're self, it's not kind of, we are self-funding our trip out there. Um, and we're volunteering mostly. So I don't know. Anyways, so we're getting ready for that, which we're leaving tomorrow sometime, some way. And so, yeah. Um, Susan says I-64, and I think she's talking about the drive across. I think it's 40. 40 goes all the way across. And in some places, I think it's like the old Route 66. I could be making this up. Um, there is a, a way that you can go across. It's 30, but the, that's a small road, highway, the Lincoln Highway, because that goes through where we are. And you can go from somewhere in New York and you can end up in California if you go all the way across. Um, I think that that would be a harrowing trip because some of the places it's like this, it's very curvy along the mountains and um, uh, especially in this time of year. We had a show with an artist, Jenny Davies Reeser, um, one year and it was in like january or february or something like that and they were just coming up from delaware but they took that back road up and i think their gps told them that way and they're like they're look a little shook from the drive up because it was a very uh wintry snaky um uh path Susan says bullet trains would be an awesome transport option. I agree. They were talking about recently and they were like talking about stopping in like New York and um, of course New York, um, but New York and um, I think Asheville or Charlotte was one of them. And then in Florida. So had, you would go between the two and it would be like super fast. Um, but I don't know whatever happened with that. Probably somebody kept all the money. Um, Donna says, yes, here in Alabama, we are never prepared for snow. I lived in Colorado and they are definitely are prepared for it. 
Um, Donna says, I did order one of the new kits this morning. Thank you so much. Um, Cindy says, don't like ice or snow. That's why I live in Florida at the moment. I can see that, uh, the appeal of that. Uh, Eden says, East Coast near New Jersey. That's what I thought. William says, it's crazy up here in Johnstown. Roads are so icy, people slip sliding around. Oh, no. I know William had to go up to the um, the new building to check on things um, because it's, you know, the first snow and stuff. So he's up there making sure that everything's taken care of. Um, so, you know, we're trying to be good building owner people. Um, Donna says, and I... Um, I think she was saying, I hate ice more than snow. Cynthia said, that is lies. People said it didn't snow that much in Ohio, too. What were they comparing it to, Alaska? Um, yeah, uh, and I think where you lived, um, particularly when you were, got out of college, you got the lake effect snow. Um, nobody told me what lake effect snow is. When I lived in New York City, we, it was like, you know, they would snow, um, but they, you know, took care of the roads and the sidewalks and everything. And it was relatively warm. Um, so I was not prepared for, for some of this lake effect snow stuff that we get sometimes. Um, Cindy said, ha ha ha, sorry, it's snow. They're snowing there too. I lived in West Virginia in Ohio and traveled between the two states and it sucks. Um, Susan says, that's it. I used to live just off of part of the old Route 66. Um, I think it's kind of like charming. Like I get um, bewitched by the nostalgia of things like that. And so like, I'm like, oh, look, there's a, there's a stop, there's a stop. And um, sometimes people who drive with me are like, they're like, oh, here he goes. He wants to go take a picture with a giant coffee pot now. And I'm like, oh, look, there's a sign. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes I do that. So it's probably good that we're, we're driving so that William can enjoy all of our, our many stops. Um, I was thinking, like, I was like, oh, what if we go, like, super early, and by early, like, not super, super early, but, like, regular time, and then go and stop at that Brandywine Museum, and then spend, like, the afternoon at the museum, and then go up, go see our friend Marsha. Um, but I don't know how that's going to work out, because there's actually quite a lot of stuff that we have to do before we can leave. And um, we've only scraped the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, Donna says, yep, it's I-40. That's interstate we took when my ex moved us to Colorado. Yeah, we used to take that. And I think the one down below, um, Suzanne probably knows because it drives through there. It's like I-10 or I-20 or something. Maybe both. Um Susan says, careful, William. Donna says, OMG, lake effect snow is horrid. Yeah, I was not prepared for that. The first time I experienced lake effect snow um, is when I visited my friend at the Chicago Art Institute um, for Christmas um, one year. And uh, let me just tell you, I was not prepared. I was like, oh, yeah, it gets cold in New York. It gets, there's snow. I was not prepared. There was ropes in between the buildings and you had to like pull yourself along these ropes and the wind would cut your face. I had these marks on my face and um, yeah, I was not prepared for that. That was not my favorite uh, trip. I got super sick and we just stayed um, in the dorm room basically eating cans of soup that we hauled across the tundra and the ice. Um, Susan says, Chicago is notorious for lake effects now. 
it's like you read my mind. Um, Cynthia says, Susan, I nearly got blown away in Chicago. So cold and windy. Same, same y'all. I don't know how y'all do it. Sturdier stock than me, that's what. Um, Marion says, I have a giant Easter egg nearby. Oh, that's festive. We made a largish Easter egg, but it wasn't that big. I'd love to make a giant Paolo out in that's like as tall as the building. Um, but we'll have to put a pin in that for now. William's like, oh, I would like to do that as well. But we all we also have to buy food. So maybe not the the concrete and scaffolding to make this giant statue. Um, but one day, maybe, there will be signs. Suzanne says, I-10. That's where, that's that road that goes along the, 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 the base of the country, like El Paso and stuff. Um, Donna says, it's very beautiful drive. I-10 does skirt the coast. Yes, that's a nice drive. Though there are parts that are a little bit worrisome to me. Like there are like swampy areas and they're like, oh, the next gas station is in like 60 miles. And you're like, you, you start looking at your gas tank. Um, so that happens. Miriam says, most years we get a lot of snow, but none from lake effect. And Susan says, Cynthia. My cousin Lexi posted a picture of herself after walking through the Chicago streets during a big snowstorm. I didn't recognize her. And then Cynthia says, I bet. I was there for a national doll art convention and had to buy warmer clothes because what I, what I brought wasn't enough for me. I bundled up like I was going to Antarctica. I feel as though this is a common thing in our lives. Um, we went to Tucson one year and it got so cold. It got bitterly cold. Um, and so as we walked around, uh, and I, the African village and some of the shows, Cynthia kept buying layers and layers. And so by the end of it, I took a picture of her. It almost looked like a lollipop. There was so much stuff like draped around her head and around the shoulders and it was like, you know, cocooning up. Every stop that was it, they had a pashmina. We got one. Um, I don't blame her. That was a very cold year. Um, and then one time, we were, I forget where we were at. Um, I think we were in Seattle. And I brought all of this clothes that that was like, um, was, was like sweaters and stuff. But they were, like, it, it just felt like the wind blew through the clothes. Um, so we had to go to, like, the Target and get, like, this windbreaker. And, like, I never realized, like, the windbreaker was actually for, I thought, I was like, oh, that's just, like, for fashion. No, that actually is for, there is a reason why people, why this exists in our world. is because it prevents the, the cold air from shooting through the the layers of your clothing and absorbing into your bones um and so yeah we had to um get some windbreakers and stuff because i thought i was gonna like i don't know i was like i thought it was supposed to be like not like this but we went on the bainbridge ferry and i thought i was gonna end up being a popsicle um, Marion says, yeah, all, all that damp air in Seattle. It was really beautiful. And I thought it was a gorgeous place, but it was like, I want to say it was in the spring and, um, it was, it was bone chilling. Um, and, uh, we went on that ferry and I was like, I was going to do like on the Titanic movie where they like go, I was like, Cynthia, hold me while you while I um, put my hands out and um, live my best Rose life. Um, and she's like, no. Um, 
but I was like, okay, I'll do it on my own. And I was going to be like out there and, um, let, you know, be on top of the world or whatever. And then I was like, nah, skip, skip. That's like when I watch these shows and they're like flying through, flying through the clouds and stuff. I was like, I hope they, they put a jacket on that they got that windbreaker because I bet it's cold up there. Like I would like that to like be able to fly or whatever. But also at the same time, um, I will have to have like a magic cape that goes along with it. It's like insulated and thermally protected because like I, I'm like, I don't know, too cold, too cold. We only fl fly like low to the ground, I guess, and like in this tropical areas because this like fly up into the skies and see outer space and stuff. It's not going to do it. I get on the plane. I'm like against the glass. I'm like, there's a slight chill on the glass. I'm like, so, yeah, uh, uh. Um, Cynthia says, I'm always cold. I can't stand being in the cold weather now. My hands ache like crazy. Same. Um, but I think we've made the, the best of our little cottage. We started the fire. I don't know if William told you about that. But we started the pellet stove, the wood pellet stove, and it's nice and toasty in here. And then we have this split system, which also keeps it nice and toasty. So even though I am cold weather averse and have been talking about it for almost one hour, we haven't done any projects, y'all. But if we, uh, I was like, oh, we'll just bust out a real quick project because I got a lot of work to do. Instead, we talked about ice and snow for almost an hour. Uh, speaking of ice and snow, let's make this bracelet inspired by the ice and snow. How about it? Who's ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to embrace your frosty, frosty self? Um, all right. Um... Let's do it. I'm going to switch the camera around so you're going to see the ceiling for a second. Hopefully, those people who are watching, and was like, I, they're like, I thought we were making bracelets, y'all. Instead, he's just like complaining about being cold all over the country. Um, so, all right. We're doing it, y'all. Ooh. All right, um, one thing, and I'm gonna say it every time, just in case the StreamYard people watch these, um, I wish there was a simpler way to switch cameras from front to back. Let me tell y'all, it would save me some time. All right, so for this project, there are a lot of ways that you can measure how big of a bangle you need to make. Um, the simplest and easiest way is to find a bangle that fits your hand, like so, that's comfortable to put on and off, and uh, use that as your guide. It does not have to be anything fancy. This is a plastic one from the 80s. Um, maybe that's fancy nowadays. I, I should look up uh, uh, vintage uh, plastic bangles. But there are. this is a good way to measure it because um, it's, it's rigid. Sometimes when I'm measuring bangles and things or, or my wrist for bracelets, I'll use a piece of cloth or I'll use a string or whatever and get the measurement that way. However, the issue with that is that sometimes it can be a little bit weeble wobbly um, when you're trying to get an accurate measurement. All right, y'all. So it's sometimes helpful just to find one of these bangles, inexpensive bangles, find one that fits, and then use that as your template. All right. So the other thing that I'm going to use, and there is a, some specialized equipment that I'm using today. 
there are ways of getting around this if you don't have these tools. For the tools you, in this project, we will need a nice cutter. Um, we are using some heavier gauge uh, wire. So just be mindful that if you have a heavier gauge wire, you're gonna wanna upgrade to uh, uh, a more sturdy pair. This pair works beautifully with 18 gauge wire, but um, if you've got like those real fine delicate ones, um, maybe upgrade to a little bit sturdier variety so you don't nick up your, your good cutters. Um, I have lots of different cutters. I have ones that are kind of like my industrial friend that are from the Ace Hardware store that cuts through. It's basically a bolt cutter. Um, and I use that for really heavy gauge wire. Um, we're not going to be getting too, too heavy, like not too heavy, uh, because I want to be able to do this and manipulate it without heating um, the wire. Sometimes when you're working with heavier gauge wire, you have to anneal your wire so that it's malleable and easy to bend. Um, that's a good lesson in general. Softening the metal by heating it is super, super duper helpful. Um, we're not going to really get into that today because um, we don't need to do it for this project. So I'm not going to. All right. So I've got our cutters. We're going to use something for a mandrel. I have this big, heavy steel um, uh, mandrel, uh, which is super helpful. If you don't have this, there are wooden ones available. You can use all kinds of things that you find around your house. Um, uh, you just have to be mindful of how you use them. And we'll, I'll get into that a little bit more later on. But we will need something that we're going to use for our mandrel. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to use one of these bangles as something that we can use as a template. And we're going to also use our, this is a nylon hammer, basically plastic hammer. Um, you can use a, a, a rawhide mallet. If you do use your rawhide mallet, just make sure that you condition your hammer face before you use it. So what that means is when they are making these rawhide mallets, it's basically a strip of leather that they put with a plus, uh, a glue, and then they roll it real, real tight, real, real tight, and they make like a log, and that forms this part. Um, and sometimes what happens is that glue that they use is super duper duper hard. Um, and that glue, it squeezes out the sides and forms a layer on the face of the hammer. And that layer can actually be super hard and ding up your metal all day long. So if you want to get what uh, the ideal usage for your hammer, for a rawhide hammer, is get some kind of abrasive and just go to town and get that layer of glue off of the face of your hammer and that will make a nice softer um, blow and it won't ding up or mess up your your wire now um, one of the reasons why that's kind of important is that if you hit um, so depending on how you use your your hammer or your mallet um, if you hit on this edge, it can make a really deep and sharp impression in the wire. Um, normally, when you're working with like steel, that's a more of a concern. Um, but if you have that and an untreated kind of rawhide mallet, you can make a ding in that, and it will create a weak spot, and you'll go to bend your wire, and it will just snap. So having this being like conditioned and um, uh, knowing what you're kind of getting into um, 
is super helpful. So when you're striking with this type of hammer, we're mostly going to focus on this face of the hammer. We're not really going to be, we're going to avoid hitting it with the edges here. All right. Um, because that will create dings and sometimes the dings will create weak spots. And um, when you're, we're going to town with our wire manipulation station time, um, it can get problematic. All right. So focus right here, either a nylon hammer or rawhide hammer. All right. So we've got our cutters, our hammer, our template, our mandrel, and then we'll need wire. Um, this is 18 gauge bronze wire. I love bronze wire. Um, you know, it's a little bit trickier to find sometimes. I believe we sell it at the store. Um, when I go, I, um, some people like brass wire. Um, brass wire is um, a different alloy. So it has more of a green kind of gold to it. It's also a stiffer wire. Bronze is a little bit softer and a little bit more forgiving. It is hard. It's hard, don't get me wrong, but it's softer and a little bit more malleable than the brass wire. Um, for the um, also embellishment, this is, um, I believe this is a brass wire and it's a 30 gauge, 30 gauge wire. Um, and also I have um, some 24 gauge and this is a bronze wire as well. Um, you can get craft wire for the thinner gauges and that makes it super malleable um, and easier to use. Um, and you can get the one of your choice. Um, I generally will stick to mostly pure metals if I'm doing anything with heat, because sometimes the coatings on wires can burn off and stuff. We're not really gonna get into that, so uh, don't worry about it. Now, I also have some round nose pliers, and I also have chain nose pliers or needle nose pliers, and those are really good um, to help manipulate the ends of the wires. Um, you, as this project is fairly easy, and most of this project you can probably do with your fingertips. However, uh, if you can use tools, use them. They are meant to be used, um, and they will protect your fingers. Um, the ends of wire can get really sharp, which there are a lot of tricks to combat that. You can take sandpaper and sand down any kind of burrs or sharp points. There's also a cup burr that you can get into, which is basically just this little cup-shaped burr or bit that you put on the end and you just twist it or you take the, the, uh, the Dremel or a flex shaft or whatever you have and you put that bit in there or burr and then you go up through that and it rounds off the edges. Um, you can also just sand it or file it. Depends on how particular you are with it. Um, I don't like to get cut, so I try to be mindful of that. Um, I've also got some sandpaper here off to the side, that's um, 220 sandpaper. It's pretty, it's pretty rough, um, but that's probably one of the sandpapers that I use the most, um, just because it's a very multi-purpose. I always recommend if you are doing any kind of aggressive sanding, make sure to be in a well-ventilated area and that you wear protection on your face because metal dust and is no joke, y'all, um, it can go up into your lung holes and, um, and then live there forever. So just be careful, y'all. Um, and you know your body best um, and what you are willing to do. Um, some people are like, you need to put on this suit that's like hermetically sealed whenever you do anything metal related. Um, and if I did that, I would never do any kind of metal smithing. So... You have to be careful so that you don't uh, wear out your body. 
but also you, you know, you have to use your own good common sense. All right. So, um, I see a couple comments. Um, let's see. Um, Bonnie says, I'm chilling watching this after spending three days in the hospital. My husband had a mini stroke and it was at our cabin. So not close to any hospitals. Oh no. Hopefully everything's okay, Bonnie. We were wondering about you. Um, all right. So I'm going to get my, uh, mandrel and I'm going to place my bracelet on this mandrel. Now, one thing you're going to notice is that it doesn't line up because this is shaped, this has a oval shape to it, and this is a round shape to it. Um, so when you're manipulating the wire on this, be mindful of that because guess what? Uh, it will shift. Um, you may be thinking, oh, I'm making it and it's, 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 it's just at this line. Um, actually it's not. So just be mindful of that. Um, all right. So I'm going to cut off maybe three feet, three and a half feet of this 18 gauge wire. And it is kind of a lot, um, but that's all right. Uh, it will make it a little bit sturdier when I'm using this. All right. I'm just going to sand down the ends. I know that was so, um, so uh, super duper scientific. And I'm just gonna feel, make sure it's not sharp. All right, and the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this mandrel, and this is easier when you're on your bench because you can kind of rest it in the bench pen. Um, and, whoop. It's 100% easier when you're on the bench pen, you know, and don't have a camera stand in the way. So, I'm just going to make sure I'm mindful of the end so I don't inadvertently stab my eye hole and measure it like so. And this is a very rough guesstimation of this, all right? Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pretend that it's smaller. So I'm gonna cross this over. This is gonna be about two inches that it crosses over. And I'm gonna bend this wire up like so, all right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this off of my mandrel, and this is kind of a wonka doodle shape, but it's fine. And I'm just gonna bend this over, and I'm going to then get my tools out and use them to manipulate the wire, because you're gonna get a much tighter fit if you do this with the um, like, uh, pliers, you know, my hands are not as strong as they used to be. So I rely on my tools because I, um, you know, I have to be mindful of my limitations and what I can do and cannot do. All right. And so when I get towards the end, I'm going to gently twist this in on itself so that it will, when I um, twerk this tighter and bend this in on itself, it's going to want to um, fold into the curve of the coil. All right, so this is my, my piece so far. It's nothing fancy um, at all at this point. Um, I'm measuring it and look, it works, all right? 
it's roughly a little bit, it's a little small. Um, so if it is, if you end up with it being a little bit small, you can always pull this a little bit longer and it's going to be a, you can, because when we weave the wire around, it's going to take up space. So we want to make sure it's a smidgen larger than our template that we're using. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this wire and I'm going to weave it in and out of my loop. All right. And I am going to be kind of careful about this so I don't kink up the wire. Um, so I'm gonna try wherever possible not to kink it up. And what this means is I'm not gonna try to go, I'm gonna work with the wire and the shape and memory of the wire that's currently in place so that I can kind of smoothly manipulate the wire around this. One of the number one things I see with um, beginner wire work kind of uh, foibles is that people will want to let, they don't want to let go of the wire. They just want to hold on to that wire and come hell or high water, they're going to stay in that one position and they're going to make the wire do what they want it to do. And it will do it. However, it will pick up the marks that are being left into it. So um, if it if it's getting to a point where you feel like it's going to kink, where it's going to bend in a way that will create a sharp kind of spot, uh, take a break, set it down, pick it up again, and don't try to force it overtly. All right. As you see, I'm just gently kind of uh, weaving this around and I'm not kinking it up. I'm going in and out of this um, uh, loop, but I'm not going to um, uh, create any hard uh, bends in this wire. All right. And um, you can switch up how tightly you um, weave it in and out. So if you want it to be a little bit tighter, you can make more in and out motions. And what I mean is go in and then out, or you can do fewer. It will just make it smaller. So you will have to manipulate it later on. So that's it's fine if you have to do that. Um, just be mindful. Now, every once in a while, if there's a bunch that are kind of uh, sticking up away from each other, you can go in and um, try to go uh, and use this wire that we're weaving in and out to secure those together so it's not super gappy. We don't want there to be a ton of gaps um, in this. I mean, I guess you could and it's not going to hurt anything, but um, just be mindful of it. Because um, otherwise, the more you're building up this visual bulk and stuff, um, the smaller your bangle will become and the less likely it will actually fit um, if you... Um, add too much volume to your bracelet. And if you want to have more volume to your bracelet, uh, just, um, you know, uh, uh, if, just uh, put that into your calculations when you're starting that and just start with a bigger loop. And then you can do, um, uh, you know, when you fill that space in. Um, I saw somebody was doing some jewelry for, excuse me, um, New York Jewelry Week. And uh, one of their kind of things was accessibility and having all of the their jewelry able to fit multiple sizes of wrists and people. And, and um, I thought that was really, um, really kind of... Uh, important of what they're you know they're talking about because so often people get excluded 
And so for me, it's all about how we can include more people. And so the artists, and I can't remember their name off the top of my head, but they have this design where they have this great big bangle and they have these springs worked in there so that you could slip it on. And no matter what your wrist size was, um, it would kind of fold in and it would accommodate all different kinds of wrist sizes. So it got me kind of thinking about things. Um, this design, I don't know if we can do that or not. Um, I, I don't know if, if that is possible yet. I have to kind of think about that a little bit more. Um, but um, I think that that's, it's a good thing to think about that. All right, so when we get towards the end, we don't have to use up all of our wire. Um, just keep in mind, if, if you uh, wrap this around and you're like, oh, done, that's good. I don't want to add more. You can always stop short and you don't have to use every little bit. Um, I like to use as much wire as, as possible so there's not a lot of waste. Um, eventually, when you find your stopping point, you're going to take your uh, end and um, go through this and just coil this around tightly. This has to be relatively super secure. Otherwise, it will come apart um, over time. So you do want to have something that is going to be, you know, you want your coils to be tight um, so that your bracelet doesn't come apart. Um, all right. So I've got this. I'm just going to wrap this wire around, coiling it around like so. I'm going to tighten this up and really get in there and get that on there nice and tight. So this is good and tight. Now I can use my template and see if it matches. It's a wee bit larger and that's okay. We designed that into our piece. So, um, you know, that we can uh, build that into our factor. Now this is pretty rigid, surprisingly, from what we have done so far with it. Just that, kind of bare minimum weaving technique has created a relatively sturdy bangle. But to make it really sturdy, that's where this comes in handy. Now, because this is not a perfect round shape, um, I'm only going to work where this meets the metal, all right? So if that... Uh, to rephrase that so it makes sense a little easier is like when I'm looking at this, there are different points where this meets and you're going to want to get the one that is the most flush with it. All right. So you'll look at your shape and you're not going to pick if you had turned this on the side, this is got because um, this is an oval. If you turn this on the side, this side bows out more. And so it creates a sharper point. I'm going to skip this part and more move to the flatter part so that there's more um, more con surface contact um, with the wire. Um, and this is a technique called planishing, is where you uh, kind of you're polishing up you're polishing up your metal um, between another metal surface. Um, and you want to get that right surface, uh, the right uh, curvature of your your, your uh, bangle. Um, this is kind of like when you're making a bowl and you have to match your stake to um, the to the kind of curve that you want. If you just go and you use any stake, if you like switch the stakes when you're making bowls your bowl is gonna change and it's because that curvature is different um, every time. So I'm going to be focusing my blows in the middle of this hammer and I am going to uh, focus mostly on the flat part of this, this mandrel. Now this will increase the size of this, this bangle slightly and that's okay. And I'm not really hitting it super duper hard. Um, 
it is helping. Um, I am hitting multiple uh, um, pieces of wire that are overlapping. So I don't want to go too aggressively because if I do too aggressively, sometimes that wire can cut itself because it's overlapping. Um, so just keep that in mind. So I'm just gently tapping. I'm bracing this um, on the table and in my hand. So there's three points of connection. One here, one here, which is really down here, and one here. And this creates a triangle that's gonna make it more sturdy. Um, generally speaking, you have a little notch in your workbench and you can rest this in that notch and then you're, you will have a little bit more sturdiness. Um, it's, you don't want this to be wobbling. Like if you have this out in the air, that's not going to do very much. I mean, it'll do a little bit, but it's not going to do as much as if it's a brace. Also, it's not as loud. All right. So I'm just going all the way around. Just work hardening it ever so slightly. If you don't have one of these great big metal things, you can find all kinds of different shapes that you can do. Just make sure that it's sturdy enough that if you're going to hit it, it's going to, um, you know, it's not going to explode. Like you can use a can to form the shape, but I would recommend not um, uh, using anything that has filled with like, like a spray paint can, for example, because you may puncture that and it may blow up or whatever. So don't, you know, just use common sense and make sure. But this is way stiffer um, in that it's been work hardened. Now, if I wanted to, I could also put this flat on a bench block and tap it around like so. Um, I've just got a piece of felt. Um, and that's going to, I'm just using that, that thick felt. And that will also help work hard in um, the shape as well. Now, if you have any issues where, where you'll, you'll see here that this has expanded uh, slightly larger. And that's okay because we're going to be adding beads. And the beads that I've selected today are ones... I believe these ones are in one of the winter kits that we got. This is Czech glass. This is a uh, AB coated fire polished round. I'm guessing maybe six millimeter or so. Um, here is um, some crystal. This is kind of a, um, uh, uh, a mercury finish. And this is a six millimeter crystal. Um, if you have those S word crystals, those would look really pretty. I wanted to give a kind of a frosty vibe, but I also wanted to use this gold. I love uh, that ancient old gold look. So I'm just gonna cut these. Um, and so I'm ready to take them off later. All right, I'm going to use um, the 24 gauge. Um, I, I think this is brass wire, actually. Let me look. And I'm actually going to cut off a fairly substantial amount. So that means um, it's going to be a wingspan. And so that's one length of my arm and one length of the torso. All right, um, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to get the end of this wire. You can always sand that if you're particular about it. And I'm going to measure about, oh, about two inches or so. And I'm gonna use my round nose pliers. And I'm just gonna create this little kind of hook, like so, all right? And I'm gonna find a place where 
this isn't going to, um, it's not where I've already made a coil. It's going to be somewhere else in there. And then I'm just going to use that little hook and I'm going to hook that main wire here like so. All right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this around nice and firm. I'm using my fingers right now because I'm not actually touching the tip of the wire at all. So I'm just using that. But when we get closer to the end of the wire, like we are getting now, I'm gonna get those pliers out. Oop, I dropped a bead jaw. And I'm going to use these pliers so that for one, my coil is as tight as it's gonna be, but I'm not going to, even though I sanded this down, I'm not gonna be going like this and this because then when we go to cut the limes from the margaritas, then you're going to feel the burning, stinging hellfire of the acid going into the cuts. So be careful. Now, this is a very pliable wire. So um, I'm not going to need like a ton of coercion to make this happen. But I am going around this like so to tighten up that foil. All right. And it's nice and sturdy. It's really on there. All right. Okay, so that's where this comes in handy. I'm going to take some of these beads, I'm gonna string these up, and I'm going to um, string one bead, let it go all the way to the end here, and then I'm gonna take and wrap this around like so. Now, I'm when I come out on this side, I'm gonna wrap three times. That's one, two, three. Now, if you have safety glasses, that may also be a good time to put these on because this is this wire is relatively springy. And if you're not careful or you're not paying attention, uh, this can bounce up and hit your eye. So just be careful. You don't want to go blind for this frost bracelet. It's not worth it, y'all. Um, so I've got one of these crystal beads, and I'm going to use that and um, put that in there. And I think that'll give it a little bit of a variation. And I'm going to repeat the process of wrapping it three times. Now, I'm not going to do the whole bracelet all the way around. I'm just going to do this in segments. And I'm also going to do it where I go back over with a finer wire. Um, and I think that that will add a nice kind of like variation in line width, which is something that when you're drawing, you know, you talk more about variation in line width when you're... Um, when you're doing drawings, but I think that that also gives a little bit of a visual interest when you are working with wire. So if you have all the same gauge of wire, um, sometimes it can uh, look a little bit, um, you know, it's good to add different gauges so that it has that visual interest, all right? Um, the cool thing about this is since this is so malleable, wherever the wires are crossing, it's kind of picking up those shapes. So you're getting kind of these, these beautiful, it's not machined looking at all. It's got this kind of natural organic flow to it, which I think is a beautiful thing with this kind of design is um, you don't have to have things perfect. It's a good way to hide imperfections um, with this type of um, design, it's got an organic flair to it. So if you, if you mess up, you know, you can hide it. It's not going to be like super glaring. Um, I took a class um, last year and the instructor had a very modernist sensibility. So her stuff was super like clean edges. Everything was super minimal. Um, and it was beautiful work. However, if you made a mess, if you made a mistake, you could see it. Your eye like zeroed in on it. You made a little nick in your spoon or whatever, and you saw it. Like there was a slight twist 
in one of my forged spoons that I made. And you could see it. It looked wrong. However, um, if I had another teacher, um, Glenn Hoare, um, H-O-R-R, I'm not calling him a bad name or anything. Um, and he was all about organic forms. And so he built in all this texture and wire, like, um, you know, uh, twists and turns and things into his pieces to mimic uh, natural forms. And if there was a slight twist to it, you didn't even know. You thought it was a part of the design. So if you're going to go for something that's like super hard edge, you have to be very meticulous about that. Um, and minimalism is actually sometimes harder to do than to kind of embrace this kind of free flowy organic style. So just be mindful of that. All right, so I'm gonna continue adding these crystals. Um, I'm alternating. Um, you don't have to have exact one-to-one -one on this, but it does, I, I kind of like it because they do have slightly different qualities to them. One has a little bit, um, has that silver contrast into it. So it kind of contrasts uh, the gold. So some people call that clashing. I don't, I, I don't like to call it that, but um, it's got a little bit of a, you can tell the difference. Even though they look very similar, there is a difference. Um, that AB finish also helps. It adds a little bit of color. It's very subtle. It's very, very subtle, actually. Um, and yeah. Now I made, the first time I did this kind of um, wrapping uh, was many years ago before it was popular um, and I won a competition and won a boatload of charms, some of which I still have leftovers of. Um, I see Lena says, I am all for organic. I do not have the patience for perfectly structured wire work. I find it slightly anxiety inducing to look at also. I think it's cool. And if that's your vibe, you should definitely do it. But for me, like Lannis, it, uh, I like things to be a little bit more organic. Um, that's just my vibe. Um, and maybe it's because um, I am, believe it or not, a little bit lazy. Um, and I know that sounds terrible, but it's kind of true. The thing, and why I say that I'm not disparaging myself, it's because I like the ideas of things, um, but I don't always like that kind of minutia of like filing something down until your fingertips bleed. Like some people, they love that kind of work where they just go like that. They have to have everything super perfect like as perfect as it can be, they are in it to win it that way. Me, I kind of am like, oh, my concept is I want to have this like silhouette of myself. I'm not going in and using like a uh, oh, size 04 blade to cut my pieces out to so that it's like the most like tiniest blade ever. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a size two blade. All right, so I'm just going to continue this wrapping around. If you want to skip any sections, you can. And I'm actually going to show you how to do that after I add this, this one bead. Um, Susan says, perfection doesn't really exist. Um, I think uh, there, there's actually kind of, uh, there's a lot of uh, dialogue about that. Um, like in Native American jewelry, oftentimes they'll will include um, a mistake on purpose. And like in the weavings, they'll, they'll include a mistake on purpose. And the reason why is that they, they want to make, uh, they're saying, you know, that their work is not perfect and that they are not as perfect as the creator. Um, 
And so I think that's a beautiful kind of thing. So I don't have to like purposely mess up. I'll, I know I'm going to include something anyways. Um, so I don't have to like build that in. It's just going to be there. Um, but so every once in a while you can do these, like I call them like attacking kind of wrap. And that is, you don't have to go all the way three times around. You can just do it a couple times. And yeah, so, but perfection, I think it's good to hone your skills for sure. It's definitely good to practice and build your skills up. I think that it's a good way, um, you know, it's a good way to build on those traditions that have been passed down. Um, there was, I was reading a book the other day, and by the other day is months ago, and they were talking about the differences between uh, tradition-based designers and process-based designers. And tradition-based designers, they do everything exactly so every time, and it's good. It helps continue on the preservation of that, um, that information. Um, so that in itself, that's a beautiful thing. There are some people who they were taught a certain way and they only do it that way because they were, sh that's the way they were shown. Um, and there might've been a reason why they were, they did that like that, but, um, it's like with nodding on, natural fibers um they did that so that when when the cord would break the beads wouldn't go everywhere but they didn't have things like soft flex back then um so they didn't have braided steel with a nylon coating um and so uh so that made sense of why they did it that way um so for me i feel like it's important to always examine what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that's kind of the process space. Um, and I think uh, in that way, you can innovate and find new ways of doing things and change things up so that, you know, for one, that um, it accommodates you and the way that you make things, but also it can build upon those ideas and really push them forward. Um, sometimes we get stuck, you know, and doing the same things we always do because that's the way we've always done them. But I think it's a beautiful thing to be able to, you know, switch things up from time to time, try some new things. Um, recently, I um, switched my Instagram handle and, um, and I'm going to use it more mindfully for my career. Um, I've talked a little bit about this, but one of our business coaches was talking about how sometimes you are, if you're, if you're using your Instagram for business, if you're using it just for personal, that's way different. But if you're uh, using your Instagram for business, sometimes it can look a very, very chaotic and confusing when there isn't a consistency. So if you are showing like, you know, I was posting pictures of my, my cats and posting pictures of flowers and of trips we took and food I ate. And um, it's like, is this a lifestyle blog or what? So uh, what I did and it helped tremendously, I think, is I started to focus down on um, what I was showing. And so I started a personal account, which I just started last night. And it's actually my old name that I had before I, up, I switched it to the professional one. So there's one picture, it's of Gilbert. Um, and it's kind of a uh, a placeholder for my own personal things. And I think, um, cause I, I experiment a lot with my process. So I do a lot of different things. Like 
I paint and I make paper and I do all these different creative things. But I don't necessarily think that all of those things necessarily are a part of my my design language. So for me, I kind of have to learn to narrow my focus. And my way of doing that is just not showing everything all in the, the same place. Um, if that makes any sense. Um, Lena says, yes, organic still takes skill. If a skilled person does it, it looks amazing, which they have honed through practice. If it's not, it's a hot mess, you can tell. Um, yeah, I think it's like anything. It's like the more you have control over your, your process, usually the better you are. Sometimes there is a beauty in that kind of chaos and that kind of uh, whatever happens, happens kind of vibe. And that can be cool too. Um, but you know, that it's kind of, it's tricky. It's like catching lightning in the bottle then, you know? So I'm getting close to the end of where I'm wrapping. And I know this is probably not the most exciting thing because I'm just basically duplicating the same thing over and over. Um, but you know, it's, uh, we've been talking, having fun. Um, so since I'm getting closer to the end, I'm going to bust out my pliers and I'm going to use them to manipulate the ends of this wire. All right. Remember margaritas, we don't want to put salt in the wound. Um, so I want to keep my fingertips, uh, um, as nice as possible. And I know we, that sometimes we don't talk a lot about that as makers. Like sometimes I know, um, I went to one show and one of my metalsmith friends, they handed me something and they touched my hand. This is before the pandemic, y'all. Um, and they're like, your hands are so smooth. And they were really embarrassed because their hands were rough. And I was like, there, there's no reason to be embarrassed. I mean, you're using your hands to work. However, one thing that w was a problem for them was that they were making those micro cuts in their fingers and they were actually getting infected. So they were having all kinds of their skin was super painful and they were having a lot of issues and it was affecting their ability to work. And those little cuts were getting infected and they, you know, they actually had to go on antibiotics and do a bunch of stuff because it was getting pretty gnarly. So, um, you know, it may seem like I'm being vainglorious or like I'm being a prude or, or that I'm not just like digging my fingers into the the you know like i'm being overly pristine or something um but you know when you create those punctures in your flesh and things get in it can cause problems and i'm not just saying that to say things um i think what i'm going to do to add a little bit of variation and to dress this up a little bit is i'm going to take um i have some of these brass beads in um uh, they're a size eight, I believe they are. Um, I have these from a project left over. I also have these gold pearls, which I kind of think are kind of cool. These ones came from our, uh, it was, it was a red and gold kit. I don't remember what that's called. Um, And I don't remember. I was like, oh, it's going to be called this and this. I, was, I, don't, I don't know. All right. So I'm going to get a couple of these out. And what I'm going to do is, like I was talking about earlier, about with design and using variation, um, is I've kind of built in this pattern, right? So check glass, crystal, check glass, crystal, check glass, crystal. And so I want to give it a little bit more of that kind of, a little bit more um, variation. I want to have a little bit more play in this. Um, so it looks more organic. So I'm actually going to find some of these. 
uh, crystal beads that are fire polish crystal beads size three millimeter. And they're in a bag. That's somewhere. And I just grabbed some of the kits, the new kits that I didn't show last night um, while I was up. So I can show you some of those. We'll take a little interlude um, and I can show you those real quick. Um, I think I'm going to use I was gonna use some check loss, but I might use some, I have some chip and this is some quartz chip and I might use some of that in this design or I might use some tiny, tiny, I could probably use some seed beads. I've got some really cute, um, Crystal AB finish seed beads that I could use in the um, and if you got our winter garden kit, um, some of these may be in there as well. And again, this is just so that it breaks up the that kind of the size. We're gonna take a, a minor break for a second. I'm gonna show you the new kits. I didn't show them. Uh, I don't think William had a chance to show them um, yesterday. I'm going to move some of this out of the way um, because my area is getting kind of clogged up. So this is a new, it's, I call it the Christmas kitsch. Um, and I kind of think it's fun. I don't know if you showed you this one last night, but this has a strand of check glass here. It's got a little lamp works. Uh, snowman. Um, it's got this furnace glass, which I I tried to match up everything so all the kids match, but it, it is a kind of a random mix of this Christmas colored um, uh, uh, Christmas colored furnace glass. And then, and I'm not 100% sure, but I believe these are David Christensen um, furnace glass. So... And then there's these hand-painted snowmans. I mean, these are super primitive. Oh, I need to... Um, all right. So there were... Um, so they're super primitive, but I think they're still pretty cute. They're charming. Um, these are painted wood. They're hand-painted. Um and I think those are just really fun, you know? Um, sometimes people get so serious around the holidays, and I get it. There's a lot of anxiety about money or the end of the year or the weather. Um, but sometimes it's good to just have fun and make something silly. Some fire polish check glass. Um, there are these gold-plated pewter pieces, um, which I think are super cute. These little bows. I included some of these these um, check glass textured rectangles, and my idea kind of was like that you could maybe wire that somehow so that it looked like a gift. Does that look cute? I think that could be cute. Um, there are also these check glass pressed um, Christmas trees or Yule trees. Um, I've got them in red and green. I mean, we went like I, I uh, normally I try to find color palettes that are different or things that are are unusual. But I went whole hog into this, and these are some lamp work um, uh, Christmas beads. There's a little Santa, and this has got some swirls. Um, so this is I call it the Christmas Kitsch. Get, um, kit that's available on our website at allegorygallery.com.
Amazon.com. All right. Uh, I don't know the price on that one. I don't know any of the prices. Um, some of these are very limited quantities. The next kit that I'm going to show you is one that there's only four of. Um, I only made four because they're quite large. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in them. So I only made four of the next one. So if you want that one and it's not already sold out, I don't know if it's sold out or not. Um, but if you want this next one coming up, you got to grab this because there's only, I only made four of them. For one, some of the materials, all of the kits have some vintage components to them. So that's one of the reasons why I, generally speaking, only make so many. And I know somebody was watching a, an old YouTube video from a um, couple years ago at this point. And they're like, how come you don't have this thing? I want this thing. You have this thing in this video and you don't have this thing anymore. And I was like, you know what? I wish I did. I wish I had them coming out of my ears and could sell them a thousand times over. However, um, sometimes when you're working with vintage components, uh, you only have so many. And when you run out, you run out. Um, and you'll not be able to get them again. So the next one is this big one. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a big kit, y'all. Little chunky monkey style. This is the one that we only have four um, available. Now, um, this is, again, that kind of Christmas kitsch colors. Um, which I think is charming. Um, so I have this strand of Chinese crystal. These are drops. These are super sparkly. So I had these in the windowsill. Um, and at certain times of the day that would just hit the light, the sun would hit it and it would just sparkles would fill the whole room. So even if you don't do anything with it, just put it in a bowl next to the window and as long as you got the right sunlight. Um, this is some vintage plastic. I got this from Heather DeSimone a long time ago. And I was like, is that alienation? And she didn't know what the heck I was talking about. Um, and it's that shampoo effect. Um, there's this check glass. These are super cute. These would actually go really well with our project today. Um, they're little melon beads. They're AB coated clear crystal, check glass, melon beads. I love melon beads. I love them with a deep and abiding passion. And I would wrestle with somebody to prove my, my love for them. Now, these great big gold ones, they're actually called Hamilton Gold. And they're a plastic bead that's been metalized, metal metallicized metallicized they're coated in metal and the way that they got their name of hamilton gold is that they had to use a little bit of the gold to in their solution to stick to the material and have it coat the have the metal coat the surface of the plastic so they are large but they are lightweight so these are actually pretty fun I know sometimes when people mention plastic, people are like, oh no, they got the plastic. I'm gonna turn my nose up at this. But for something like this, which is like for fun and not, I wouldn't say, I don't know. I used to be where I was like, oh, I'm not into plastic. But now I'm like, oh, plastic, I, if it's cool, it's cool, right? Um, I'm not gonna be a material snob. Um, which if you are, that's fine. I get it. I used to be like, I only want to work with this, 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 and this. And if it's not come direct from the source, then blah, blah, blah. But I kind of think nowadays I'm like, whatever you work with, as long as you put the energy and the ideas into it, you could be working with shoe strings and mud and still create something that is, is really beautiful. Um, so there are also this large strand of those crystal beads. These are not the S word crystal beads. Then I've also got this in a green. 
So you got your red and green fix. This is one of those AG fine pewter bead or toggles. It's a larger one. Um, I figured if I was going to have beads like this, now's the time, y'all. Like this almost seemed weird to put with it. Like it seemed too small. But I figured if somebody wanted to have this for spacers, those might be fun. I had some of these left over from the other kit. So I put these in. These are these shell beads that, that have that beautiful mother of pearl kind of uh, that off-white creaminess to them and then these are dyed jade these little round ones are dyed jade and this is not fancy jade um you know it it's dyed jade y'all um but i thought it was fun it's kind of minty holiday vibe again no this kit there's a lot in it and a lot of the stuff is bigger but it's not like you know diamonds and stuff now these are kind of cool these are a vintage glass bead so the glass bead is actually white and then they've embellished it with this paint that they've they've painted on and this um green and red and then that kind of spider webby effect on top and this is to simulate a stone. Uh, and you, if you didn't know, you'd be like, what is that stone? It's actually glass, y'all. I think that's pretty fun. Um, and the coating is durable. I tried to uh, wipe it off. I bought some and they must have been stored in like, I don't know, an oven or something. And uh, the paint started peeling off these one vintage beads um after i sold them to some people and that was kind of embarrassing but um these ones are pretty securely put on i mean if you roll around on the concrete even you know that that's going to have something's going to happen to it so even though the best materials get can be damaged um these aren't super expensive by any stretch of the imagination but i think they're fun they're colorful they're festive they get me in the mood for the holidays. Um, a couple years ago, I was kind of like over the holidays. I think if you work in retail um, or in the restaurant industry, holidays can be a challenge sometimes. You can get kind of burnt out on the festiveness that is you know, the uh, mandatory festiveness. Um, and I was definitely burnt out on the holidays. Um, when I was a kid growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. So the holidays were always a little bit kind of stressful. Um, well, Christmas. Um, so I never really love, like I, I guess I have fond memories of Christmas and stuff, but um you know, it was really stressful. So um, it wasn't my favorite. Like Halloween, I loved Halloween. Thanksgiving, I love Thanksgiving. Um, but Christmas was always a little bit stressful. So it was never one of my like top 10 favorites. Maybe when I was like little, little, and I didn't know anything. Um, but as I got older, I became aware of more of the disparity Um with our socioeconomics. And so that always kind of made it a little bit stressful in that way. But anyways, so when I was growing, um, a couple of years ago, I was really kind of burnt out with Christmas. I was like, I am not into it. I've been listening to the Christmas carols on repeat at the store. And if I have to listen to Mariah Carey sing one more time, it's going, it's, my ears are just going to bust and just explode with the blood. Um, so what I did to kind of get into the mood is, I started researching winter festivals and holidays around the world. Um, and there's things like Krampus and I did a Krampus painting and the Christmas witch, which is from like Ita uh, from Italy, La Bofania and um, uh, the Yule cat. And so um, these are kind of my Yule cat earrings. And um, basically, there's this giant cat, and this is like must be the the industrial times. But anyways, they had uh, 
these cat, this cat is called, uh, I can't say it in the link, it's maybe Icelandic, um, but it's called the Yule cat. And basically it's a giant cat that's out in the woods and you had to make clothes or you had to, you had to meet your quota um, when you're making these like fabrics, when then you can't go out and farm, you had to do your handiwork when it was cold and make clothes. And so for the Yule time, if you didn't make enough or if you didn't wear the new, a new piece of clothing, then the cat would eat you. Um, so that's like a fear factor thing. But also I feel like in, with a lot of those kinds of more grim and kind of scary stories uh, around the holidays, it was because it was a really hard time of the year. Um, you know, nowadays, you know, there's a lot of like uh, pressure and in, in different ways and it's hard in that way. But I think in a grander context, that a long time ago, it used to be life or death. And um, I mean, it's still like that for some people nowadays. But um, back then, it was definitely there was a, a high child mortality rate. And so I felt like a lot of these stories that were told um, where children get, you know, taken away or they get eaten up by this fantastical creature. Um, it's kind of a way to explain away and kind of give comfort that, um, you know, it, you know, it's a cautionary tale to do what you're supposed to do and act right. And if you follow these rules, then, then you are m more likely to live. And so I, I think it's really fascinating when you look at these things through that cultural perspective, where you kind of examine why they had these stories and what those stories meant. So anyways, I think it's kind of fun to explore those. And so I got into a kick of researching different traditions around the world. And that's what inspired this. This is the Yule cat earrings. They have a little bow and then a little crystal. And um, these make up super fast earrings. So if you need a gift, here you go. This is super fast. Um, you just have to know how to wire wrap and then there you go. Um, and if you wanted to, if you want to make these longer, you could put spacers in between. But I didn't include any of those spacers, so you're going to have to raid your stash for those. Because I thought it was kind of cute if it if it was kind of compact. Um, so, yeah, I think that's fun. Um, so, there you go. So that's a new one. That kit is a small kit. It's a mini kit, mini inspiration kit. Um, and that's available on our website. That's allegorygallery.com. You can find this kit and all the other holiday themed kits on our website. Um, like I said, some of them, I only made limited quantities. So some of them are already sold out. Um, one of the other kind of kits that I made, which is a little bit of a different um take is this this winter solstice kit um and it's the shortest day but there's all of these uh kind of references to the sun and the sun becoming once winter solstice happens then there's more light so after the winter solstice so we're going we're literally in the dark times y'all um, and it's only going to get darker until after the winter solstice when you start seeing more of the sun. And so there's like a sun motif and we have this uh, AG fine pewter sun pendant in this copper color. And I thought that this would look really beautiful with this check glass. It's a, it's a kind of a cobalt blue that's been dusted on one side with a um, kind of a uh, antique bronze kind of copper color. And then these really fun, um, they're coated, um, they're pony beads, but they're check glass pony beads. I know sometimes when people think of uh, 
of pony beads or roller beads, they kind of get disdainful of them because their their point of contact is plastic ones. But I think that these gloss ones are really fun, um, and you can work those in, and they provide a nice kind of color blocking. So I think they're fun. Then I have this um, uh, vintage ceramic beads in that beautiful cobalt midnighty blue color. And I think that's really lovely. And for uh, there are these copper covered plastic beads, which are really fun. If you want to get into working with patinas, you, I did some experiments and these actually do react to patinas. Um, what I would do is get a degreaser and wash the beads, make sure that they are super clean and use a little bit of Dawn dish detergent and wash the beads and that gets any waxes off of or uh, oils off of the surfaces of these beads which um, oils can sometimes inhibit patinas or the chemical reactions between a metal surface um, and so they uh, so you want to make sure that those are super clean you can use gloves too if you want so you're not accidentally transferring uh, the oils from your fingertips onto your beads and then um, Christy Friesen has a beautiful line of patinas called Swelligant. Um, and there's all different colors and you can use them on these metal beads, these metal covered plastic beads, and they actually do react. So um, that's a good, you know, I have some, I don't, I think they're at the house, but they, I did this beautiful kind of, verdigris that's kind of this mint chocolate chip turquoise color um and i think they're really beautiful so you can do a lot with these um a lot of times people just think that these are just cheapy beads or the because they have a, a plastic core that they don't really have a value but they are lightweight and you can embellish them if you want so there's a lot of options with that. Um, so, um, and then to finish off this kit, there is a copper, anti-copper colored AG Fine Pewter toggle. So this is the winter solstice kit, this part in here. Not any of that, just this. Um, and you can find these, like I mentioned earlier, on our website, that's allegorygallery.com. Um, if you want, there's some new thing that we're doing. It's called SMS. It's like a text message thing. If you sign up for that, you can get a coupon code. Um, I don't really know anything about that. William knows more about that. Um, so watch the videos with William in them because he can tell you more about them instead of me just making stuff up. Um, but I do know that you get coupon code if you sign up for it. So if you want to save on your kits, you can use that coupon code and save on those kits. Now, the last one that I um, put together was this one. So I made the other ones, which he showed you yesterday. He did a little teaser of them. And then I made this other one which is kind of similar to the other one that he showed. He showed another one and it's kind of similar. It's got that, that, um, that blue and white kind of vibe, but this one is a little bit, it's a little bit different. So these ones, these are silver on one side um, and it's like a mercury finished check glass, like a fire polish, um, but it's kind of got a blue silver so they've added a little bit of blue, which I think kind of adds a little bit of a frosty character to it. And then there is this little box clasp. You know, this is not a fancy box clasp. Um, it's a base metal that has some crystals in it, and it's pretty lightweight. But I thought that, that for a multi-string connector for either a bracelet or um, like a necklace, uh, I thought that was pretty fun. Um, but... If you're thinking this is this is like one of the other box class that we sell, 
that's like sterling silver and has like a vintage um, or antique button inserted or it's not that. So this is a kind of an affordable version of that. And so I've got that, um, some more check glass, some more vintage check glass. And then I've got the S word crystal um, pear drops. And I love those. I bought those because I had these plans of making a rainbow of earrings and all these different colors with those S word uh, crystals. But um, instead of hoarding them, I'm sharing them with you. So this kit is also available online. That's allegorygallery.com. If you sign up for the text message thing, you get a, a coupon code. Um, he also started doing this thing with shop pay. Um, if you um, qualify for that, it will help uh, break down purchases um, so you don't get thunderstruck all at once. So that's a nice thing that we have available if you are going to place larger orders in the online store. And also remember, if you spend over $100, you get free shipping in the U.S. Um, so that's a good little incentive too, I think. Um, and since we came out with a bunch of those, um, we are going to have those available online. Um, and we also try to combine shipping as well. So if you order something today and then you order something tonight, for example, uh, one of my little mini artworks, um, which are definitely 100% going to debut tonight. We were going to put a debut them last night, but then we're like, we debut the kids um, and you're not finished. And by you, I mean, I was not finished um, painting all the backs last night. So they definitely are going to debut tonight. Come heck or high water, they're going to debut tonight. William, I'm saying it here now. I'm making it so, all right? So lots of um, these kits available. And then I'm going to have artwork available tonight. So that's a fun way to help, uh, help fund our New York trip. Um, and it's gonna, our trip has gotten a little bit more expensive because we're having to drive and then pay for uh, a, a garage to park our car. So it's gotten a little bit more expensive. Um, but, you know, we're trying to keep things as affordable as possible. But um, so just know that if you get anything in the online store, it's going to help us with uh, offset some of the expenses of traveling, um, which, you know, adds up. Okay, I'm going to move these out of my area, and then I'm going to finish this off. And um, I'm also going to move at some point move the heater um, so that it is directly blasting my face because I'm starting to get a chill. Um, but I, you know, it is what it is. All right. So if you saw the last half of this video because we've been going for over two hours now but we talked for about an hour in the start of this video about how a lot of people struggle with the winter um some people love it but well i'm just going to talk about the negative lol um no but so uh i think it can be really pretty and I definitely think it's super pretty when uh, you see those ice crystals. So that's kind of the inspiration between this little bangle. We made the base of this bangle. I'm going to further embellish this with the 30 gauge um, uh, gold color craft wire. This stuff is like, it's like fine as hair kind of business. So it kinks up. You can look at it and it will kink up. And if you don't know what I mean by kinking up, if you look really close, you can see there is a kink there. And you can see this looks like somebody chewed it up. And you can straighten this out. However, if you straighten it out, you're also work hardening it. So if you work hard in this, it will get brittle and it will break. It is a very fine wire. It will break. Um, I'm going to say it again. It's a really fine wire and it will break. So just be mindful of it. 
don't try to work hard in it too much. It's super tempting to just straighten everything out and use a fresh piece um, or to use an old piece. Uh, but just use a fresh piece that's not all kinked up and you'll have a lot more uh, success. So I'm going to take off about a wingspan of this uh, craft wire, gold craft wire. I'm going to take the very tippy tip of my round nose pliers and I'm just gonna bend that over and create that little hook that I'm gonna need, all right? And then I'm going to find um, a part. I'm gonna go right here, maybe. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go right here. And I'm going to hook this in with my piece right here. And then this wire is super fine and you may be like, oh, I don't need tools, I don't need tools. Um, but when you do get in there, it does help to get that on there really secure. Um, you know, sometimes you don't need it to be secure and I don't know what those times are, but um, if you want that to be super secure, Break out them flyers and use those because you have. I hope you have them at this point. Um, and um, you can work in. I think I'm going to work in one of these glass pearls. This is a check glass glass pearl, and I'm going to move that down to the end. It's going to add a little bit of visual interest, I think, and fill in some of those spots. Um, I'm also going to do, I'm going to string up some of these um, metal um, seed beads, and I'm going to flank my crystal really close, like so. And I'm going to use that. I'm just going to work it, weave that into it, making sure I don't kink up my wire. And, um, you know, every so often I'm going to sprinkle some of these in here as well, which I just spilled everywhere. Um, now these ones, they were in the winter garden kit. If you miss that, um, that kit did sell out, so I apologize if you missed out. Um, a lot of the kits we're making in limited quantities because um, a lot of the pieces just have vintage components and we can only make so many. But also, you know, there are so many more people doing kits now. It used to be we were one of the only people doing kits. Like, we were really, you know, there was like us and like a, a handful of other people who are making kits like this. Now, I'm not saying that we invented kits because they've had kits forever. Um, and there are people who are making like project specific kits for ages, um, uh, well before my time, people were making kits. But um, these kind of open-ended challenges and stuff, we were doing. We were one of the only people doing them back in the day, and now there's more people doing them. So, uh, you know, back in the day, things would sell out in five minutes. Nowadays, you know, they don't. So, uh, to be mindful of that, I've just been kind of a. Uh, you know, we make less kits and hopefully we don't sit on uh, a bunch of kits. Like for a while, we actually got rid of doing kits. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we got rid of doing kits. And when we started doing these live videos, um, we had this idea of calling them nibblers. We were making smaller kits. And apparently that did not catch on. Uh, people were like, what the heck is a nibbler? Is this like a sampler, like an appetizer? And I was like, yeah, it's like an appetizer, but with beads. And that did not catch on. So um, we changed the name to Inspiration Kit. 
and they have sold significantly better since we changed that name. So sometimes um, it's all about branding, I guess, um, because the nibblers didn't do it. People were like confused. They were like, I don't know about this. Um, so I'm just doing one at a time, but if you wanted to, you could do, you could string up multiples and do three at once or however many at once and, uh, do that as well. But I think that adds a little bit of something nice. Um, Susan says, I like the nibbler handle. Did you? I think you're the only one. Because people were like, uh, I'm, I don't know I'm, what, what they're doing. Well, what's happening? One thing I will recommend is that when you're doing this kind of weaving stuff, you see them pliers on the side, move them, move them. Because this is like, it's like a hook of death. It's like catching and you're going to kink up your wire and it's going to be for naught. It's going to be like, what's happening? So sometimes it's good to have a clear area, um, you know, so that you can really manipulate your materials and not have to worry about them. So I strung up three beads of these gold beads and I'm going to work these into it as well. I'm actually might do more, maybe five. Whoa, y'all, go with five, getting wild. So I think that when you're working with these like, organic kind of design ideas, it's nice to, um, you know, symmetry is beautiful, but sometimes it's good to play around and um, sometimes go in the opposite direction, sometimes switch things up um, so that you can have a little bit of that organic flavoring and um, it will look a little bit different if you switch the, the rotation of the wire. Um, but as this is super fine, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, Lena says, sometimes I just want to make t-shirts with your quotes. And she says that Royal Road kit is lovely in person. Surprise, it's not sold. Uh, me as well. I uh, get... I don't know. I'm like, what? What happened? I thought that's the most beautiful kit. And then um, William's like, no, everybody hated it. So there you go. But I do think it's important that when you're designing and you're using kind of or an organic sensibility that you try to build in the unexpected. And whether that's including an odd number here or there, or kind of making it just kind of doing something a little bit different every once in a while, I think that will help uh, reinforce that design aesthetic um, and really kind of hone in that it is got that kind of unexpected, um, I don't know, it's got that kind of more natural and less mathematical. Um, there are, I, if you saw one of our other videos, there is, um, I got some books recently on jewelry making and I like them, but some of them, I'm gonna be honest, they bust up these calculations and formulas and it's not from me, y'all. It's not from me. And I said, somebody, this is meant for somebody else who has a brain that works this way. I'm not saying I'm dumb because I think I could figure it out if I gave myself the time to do it. But this is not from me, y'all. This is for somebody else who has a brain that works in this way. Um, and so, you know, you kind of have to find the systems that work best for you. Um, I was lucky enough to work with an artist who was of a similar mindset. And what he was talking about, he's like, I can't, I don't know math. He was like, I barely graduated high school. So I use these things called dividers. And these dividers um, 
they let me have things match, but um, I don't have to like bust out the, the math and figure out circumferences and radiuses and multiply that by time pi and do all this other stuff. So um, if your brain works like that, I know some of y'all are much more uh, analytically focused and can do that kind of mental math. Me, I don't know. It's not for me. So um, there's all kinds of tricks that you can get away with that. But I got one of them books and I was like, I don't know who this is written for, but this is not for me. I was super tempted to return it. But you never know. Maybe I'll be one of those people. Like my sister, Sheila, um, she used to do calculus for fun. And so she would like go and like do like, I was like, you're doing homework for fun. And she'd be like, yeah, I like it. Um, so if that's for you, then that's good. But for me, I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm busy. Uh, I got, I did enough of that in high school. Um, and I know some people, there was this interview with, um, that she was on Blossom. And I guess she was also on the show called The Big Bang Theory. And um, the interview was like, what is it like to have people come up to you and think that you can do calculus off the top of your head? And she's like, well, I'm actually a neuroscientist. And so I can't do that math. And I do that calculus regularly. So um, I would think that they would that they're coming to the right place. And he, they were as like shook. The, the interviewer was like, oh my gosh. How? They're like, oh, that's neat. Now, one thing that I'm gonna be, I'm gonna cautionary tell you all on is not to, I know it's tempting, you get this fine wire out and it goes so quick that it's tempting to um, just go hog wild and just cover this in uh, cover this in wrappings all day long. You're just not you're not going to stop. You're going to do what you want. You're just going to go wild, and nobody's going to tell you to stop. However, I'm going to tell you don't go too thick because if you go too thick and you wrap too much wire. And you just go, you just keep wrapping and wrapping. It will get very, not only heavy, but it will also get where um, you lose some of that um, variation. You lose some of that big wire shown and small wire shown. And um, I don't know, it kind of takes away from it. Now, you may come to part where you don't want the thin wire crossing over the thicker wire. The th nice thing is, is that this wire is so thin, this 30 gauge wire is so thin that you can actually weave it under the wires and through the wires and build in your pieces like that. So um, if you um, need to do that, you can do it and it won't add that visual bulk that I've mentioned previously. I'm gonna add one more of these glass pearls and then I think, I think that may be it y'all. It's only taken us three hours, but you know what? We've talked about life and cold weather and we talked about other stuff. So, and I always enjoy hanging out with y'all. So it's not like, it's not like I'm disappointed, you know, I'm not, sad that this video is going on the longer side. Um, all right, so I'm getting closer to the end. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get that plier out again because I don't wanna cut up my fingertips. And I'm gonna go in there and really cinch it in. Now this kind of wire is like super fine. This is great if you need to do those little French flowers, those beaded flowers with the seed beads. Um, that's super helpful for that. And then I'm just gonna run my finger around and make sure that all the beads are where they're supposed to be. 
Um, and, you know, sometimes they were going to want to flop over or because uh, some of the beads will move around, they're going to want to like flip. And I don't want there to be too much of that happening. And the reason why is that if I do too much of that, what's going to happen is that um, if there's too many little pieces in here and you go on and off with this bracelet, it's going to weaken that connection and it's going to break. And all of these beads will, in, th in theory, they may come apart. So we just want to be careful of that. Now, I've got that. And it's a little bit bigger than I would comfortably like it. But, um, you know, it's not so terrible that I couldn't wear this. It is a smidge larger than I wanted it. But um, I was trying to focus on showing you all that this would take up room. So I made it too big. I feel like that's kind of like a thing I'm like telling you, oh, be careful. Don't make it too tight. And then I end up with this and it's like gappy, um, which is not terrible. But yeah, it's like gappy here. I could have shaved off um, a quarter of an inch on each side and been completely fine. Um, but anyway, so this is the project that we made tonight, this frost uh, crystal inspired bangle. This also kind of goes with the winter garden theme. Now, if you don't like bangles and you're like, um, yeah, I don't like bangles. You know, like I, I don't know, I wrestle alligators and um, bangles will be the, the demise of me. Um, you can also take this same concept and use it to frame pendants. Um, I don't really have anything super on hand um, to, I guess you could use this. Um, so you could have this and use this as a focal. It, it, it is a large, it, this is large. I'm not going to play you. It's large. Um, but you can, you know, sometimes large is good. You can do big and bold, you know, make this, and you could do this and make a whole chain out of this type of, this style, and who has that? I don't know anybody who has a, a giant maester chain of beaded uh, loops. I don't know anybody who has that, so maybe you could be that person. Um, or you could use this as a brooch, or you know, what's that thing that I don't think this would necessarily be great for those wine goblets, but, um, you know, you could make a game, like throw this on something. Um, don't they have like a carnival game like that? You know, throw those little beaded loops. But I think these are fun. I like them. I hope you enjoyed that as well. Um... Lenses could be an ornament as well. That's a good idea. You can put a little something something in here or leave it plain. I have, um, it's a cold, uh, they call it a modern wreath and we got it from Ikea and it is basically a hoop and it has lights embedded in the hoop. So um, that's, that's about as much decorating as we do during the holidays now. We have a couple of the ceramic Christmas trees that light up, that the little bulbs are a little precariously placed in there. But um, so that's, that's, you could have this as a wreath, you know? You'd like a wreath, Feliz Navidad style. Now, if you wanted to, you could also um, weave fibers into it. That could be cool. Add a little bit of color that way. Now I'm just getting wild, y'all. Um, I have work to do, so maybe that's why I'm like, mm, I don't want to go. Um, you know what else would look really cool in this? And I'm not, I'm not procrastinating, I promise. I'm, I'm sharing genuine design consultation, uh, design ideas. Um, but we have some AG Fine Pewter leaves, and they're these little gold leaves. 
and I believe they are in the um, kit, that one kit, that winter garden kit maybe. It's in some kit, I know, because I just got done putting it in it. But um, that does look killer in there. I don't know where they are. I was going to show you, but uh, so, I don't know. Things like to hide, I guess. It's William sending a mental message to make me get off the, the TV. Um, all right. So here you go. We made this Bengal today. We talked about weather. I showed some kits that are in there. We're going to go and debut the new uh, painting sometime this evening. Uh, I got to pay for gas. Oh, here it is. Here it is, y'all. I knew I saw it. I wasn't hallucinating. You could add these in there. Wouldn't that be pretty? Wouldn't that be pretty? Put them leaves coming out or feathers. Looking out like that. You are just like, oh my. Weave that in there. Wouldn't that look nice? Um, or, you know, another thing, and I'm just going to throw this out here. We're going off script, y'all. Now, I showed um, a variation on how to do this. This is a, um, we made these acrylic circles for one of the, the TGBEs. Um, and so I showed how to do this kind of stitching, this brick stitching. But imagine, oh my gosh, that fits perfect. Oh my, it's like I planned it. I didn't plan that, y'all. Um, but you could definitely incorporate that. Wouldn't that be a pretty thing? Now this one's not going to fit as smoothly because it's got little dingle dangles on the bottom. And I didn't have that extra row on the outside. But that could be cool. You could, in theory, do this this technique um, of stitching, seed bead stitching, in here inside of this. So if you wanted to, but look at that. That looks killer, y'all. Maybe I'll make a bunch of those. That looks good. That little bit of peach warms it up. Gives it a little bit of warmth in there. That little black gives a little bit of class up in there. And then you got that multicolor gold, which matches this multicolor gold style. So, I don't know. I sometimes will play around with different components of things that I've made previously. Um, and you'd be surprised what can happen from playing around with different ideas. Sometimes you get a surprise. Like that was a surprise, but that fits so perfectly. That, there you go. That is a surprise that it fits so perfectly. And this part I got cut off. That's a surprise. That fits so perfectly. Is this like a game? Did I just invent a new game? Go hunt around the studio for concentric circles. Lena says, wire that all up and add a hook. Bonnie says, I would hang that on my tree. Um, yeah, look at that. Look how that all came together, y'all. It's like I planned it. Or if I want to break out that royal road kit that nobody liked, um, get that, put that in the middle. Little Eye of Sauron style. Yeah. We'll see. Anyway, so just playing around. I think it's good, um, you know, um, I had an idea of what I was going to make, and I made it. But sometimes little things happen along the way, unexpected little bits of happenstance that can change things up and create something new and potentially something wonderful and marvelous that you weren't expecting 
at first. So hopefully you, I, this video will also encourage you if you're still watching to um, play around, explore, be creative, innovate. You know, sometimes you just have to hold things up and see how they go. Look at that. That button fitting perfect. So I'm gonna flip this around and then we'll say goodbye. Hey everyone. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me today and hanging out and making this bangle with me. I think it turned out pretty nice. A little big, but um, you know, maybe I could wire this on. I probably could wire that on. Wire that on and then, then it's perfect size no matter what, right? Maybe make a little sandwich, add a little pop of color there. And you have a bangle, then it fits right every time. Uh, so anyways, I just came up with a new idea. We'll do it the next video, huh? Maybe. Um, so we, I did want to mention that there are going to be a few different store closures coming up um, while we're out of town. We tried to get everybody covered but um, some of the um, schedules shifted. So I think that one of the days we're gonna be closed. William made a post about that on the days that we will be closed. Um, for lives, uh, we may not have as many lives this week because of the fact that we're out of town. I'm gonna do my best to do lives from the events that we're at while we're in New York. So they may come, there's, I don't even know our schedule. So who knows when we're going to, um, where we're going to be at and when we're going to be at it. But we're going to do our best to kind of pop in frequently and show you what we're up to. Um, because why not? You get to, you know, it's like you can live vicariously through us if you're not going uh, to New York Jewelry Week um, this week, which it's already started. It started on Monday, um, and, which is yesterday. See, I know what day it is. Um, and um, there's already programming. And also there's digital programming. So there's stuff going on probably right now. Um, I'm in a show that's on a virtual show only called Queerphoria. Um, and I believe there's a panelist discussion. I thought I was going to be on this panel discussion, but apparently it was pre-recorded. Uh, so I guess I'm not going to be in this panel discussion. Um, but you should check it out. I haven't watched it yet, so I don't know what it says. So maybe don't check it out. I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's up to you. I would say watch it, but... If you're sensitive, then maybe skip it. Maybe, you know, I don't know. All right, before I get too bewitched with my bangle that I'm making, um, thank you again. Um, we will have some new things debuting in the online store tonight. So be sure to check those out. That's allegorygallery.com. And keep an eye on um, your email. Uh, because we're going to be sending out some emails uh, tonight when we debut the new goodies. So keep an eye out for that, and we'll see you later. Thank you again, and have a great night. See ya.